Welcome to the Wednesday Bible Study on March 20th of 2024. Glad you're tuning in. So happy that you desire to study God's Word with me today. We're in Acts 28, and it's been a, over a year that we have been in the study of this book, and today we come to the final verses in Acts chapter 28, the final chapter of the book. Now, we're not necessarily done with the book of Acts. We want to spend another week or possibly two looking at some lessons learned from the book, just some general lessons. We've made some applications throughout, but we do want to kind of do a 30,000-foot view kind of approach to the book next week and possibly the week after. But today, our goal is to finish up with Acts 28. While you're opening your Bibles to that chapter, let me invite you to our in-person Wednesday Bible study every Wednesday night at 7 a.m. I invite you every week, but it's an open invitation that's why I do it. You're always welcome to come and be with us for that period of Bible study right now in the book of Matthew, and then uh, a, a period of singing and, and prayer unto God on Wednesday evenings. We'd love to have you come and be with us for that. Also, every Lord's Day, every Sunday, we meet for a period of Bible study at 10 a.m. Right now, we're studying in the Minor Prophets in the book of Amos, particularly. We'll finish up chapter three of the book of Amos on Sunday morning and uh, be ready to, to begin getting into chapter 4 as well and continuing through those minor prophets. Then at 11 a.m., we meet for a period of worship, public worship. You'd be an honored guest as we carry out the acts of worship that God has presented to us in the Bible and the way that he has presented to us in the Bible. So a period of worship at 11 a.m. And then each Sunday night at 6 p.m., we have an evening period of worship We'd love to have you come and be with us for any of those. I might add that on the last Sunday of each month, instead of 6 p.m., we meet at 2 p.m. for the evening worship because we have a, a monthly meal together. And we, we would love to have you come and be with us for any of those opportunities of Bible study and worship that you might have. You'd be an honored guest, and we'd be delighted to see you. Now, let's get to Acts 28. Now, where we're picking up in verse number 11 today Paul is going to be leaving the island of Malta and continuing on to Rome as a prisoner. When this saga began, this, this period of Paul's venture to Rome as a prisoner in the, um, under the control or in the custody of uh, Julius the Centurion, uh, they, they took uh, one ship toward Asia Minor, then they got another ship of Alexandria that was headed toward Rome, and they went through the, the time period of the tumultuous seas. They end up shipwrecked on the island of Melita, and that's where we were last week as Paul interacted and engaged with what the Bible calls the barbarous people of that island. And we learned last week that just meant they weren't Greek-speaking people. And yet Paul was able to communicate with them, and we looked at the miracles that were done in that time that he spent at Malta, not only to confirm any preaching he did there, but it was also something that was going to benefit him going forward to Rome. And I think we'll see in these uh, next few verses that there was a favor that the centurion was going to show to Paul and that even once he gets to Rome, there's going to be this favorable, uh, this favorable handling of the Apostle Paul, even though he's been arrested, even though he is considered a prisoner, he is going to have a favorable uh, treatment from these Roman authorities. So we're picking up at verse number uh, 11 of Acts 28. So we, we called the first part of the chapter the miracles at Miletus, and, and that's where, uh, or Melita, uh, that's where he, you know, heals, or well, he doesn't die from the snake bite. Uh, he heals Publius' father, and then there's the host of miracles that he does after he has healed the father of Publius, the chief man. People start bringing many sick and disease to him. And now it's time to leave Mylita. And so just kind of a rundown, the exposition of the text, just to put it in a, a framework of time. It's around February of the year 
Um, remember in Acts 27, in verse number 9, he had said the fast was past. He was trying to convince them not to sail from Fairhaven, the harbor in Crete. And, and the reason being, it wasn't commodious to travel. The harbor wasn't commodious to wintering, uh, according to, to what Luke says. However, the sea was not going to be compatible for safe travel. It turns out Paul was right. They end up in the 14-day uh, tumult. So when you put all of this together, the Day of Atonement or the Day of the Fast that's mentioned in 27 and verse 9 would have occurred in, in the month of September, October. Their Jewish month that that fast would be uh, considerate of was their seventh month, which would correspond to the latter half of September and the first half of October on our calendar year. Now, in AD 59, if that's the date that, that this journey takes place, if it's in AD 59 that they set sail, thus arriving in Rome in, in the, the summer, rather the uh, winter into spring of 60, that fast would have occurred on October the 5th. If it was AD 60, the following year that they would have departed, then you're looking at September 23rd. So either October 5th or September 23rd is when that 10th day of the 7th month on the Jewish calendar would have taken place. And so that puts us now, when you think about that day, there was a, a time spent at Fair Havens. We don't know how long that was. Acts 27 and, and verse number 8 and 9 just says, that much time was spent, um, how much time and how long after the fast that was, we don't know for certain, but it would have been into the month of October for sure, and most likely into the middle part of October, because we're looking at the fast being around the 5th of October, perhaps. And if that be the case, then add two weeks to that plus a long layover, you're probably in the month of November by the time the the shipwreck occurs on the island of Melita, add three months to that because we know that that uh, uh, they spent three months there. We're told that in verse number 11 of chapter 28. And so while most wintered in a safe harbor because the conditions weren't favorable to travel, Paul and, and his companions would have had a hard time finding a ship, even going to Rome, and thus, this three-month time spent on Melita uh, is a wintering time. So that puts us kind of into the month of February. Now we're beginning toward the, the calendar uh, springtime of the year, uh, leaving winter and heading in toward spring. And so conditions are going to begin to be a little more favorable for travel. And there's going to be a feeling of better safety in that sea travel. Winds are going to be more favorable in, in the directionality needed. And so that's, you know, just kind of an update on time, where we've been. Now, when you go back to Acts 21, where Paul is first arrested, where the tumult initially breaks out and he addresses those Jews uh, from the steps of the, uh, the tower or the castle, the uh, uh, citadel of, of that army, uh, Roman uh, post, uh, where Lysias is able to, to conceal him or is able to, to keep him from being pulled apart by the mob. We've had over two years of time that has passed since Acts 21. And so now as Paul is, is finally at a point where he's about to enter Rome or head toward Rome, uh, we, we've spent a great deal of time. We're sometime in the month of February. Now, it says in verse 11 that after three months, we departed in a ship of Alexandria. Now, this is the second ship from Alexandria. Alexandria would have been down in the far uh, southern or southwestern uh, part of the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, down close to, uh, well, off the coast of Egypt anyways. And so 
uh, these ships were were from that place, thus probably carrying grain. And this is the second of these ships from Alexandria. The first is the one that wrecked, uh, as we saw in chapter 27. Now this ship from Alexandria, it had wintered in the isle. So it had been at Miletus for the winter time. And it says whose sign was Castor and Pollux. Now the the names Castor and Pollux here are the names of the twins or the twin brothers. Uh, maybe you're familiar with the constellations. You've heard about the Big Dipper and the Little Dipper and, and the other constellations in, in the skies, the, the patterns of the stars. Well, this would be the constellation Gemini uh, would, would be representative of the twins, Castor and Pollux. They were considered... Uh, to be the gods of the sailors, or the gods of the sea in this case, uh, watching over those that that would would travel upon the sea. Now, this isn't to say that Paul believed in them, and it's not to say that Paul was going to uh, purport himself toward an idolatrous belief. He was just taking ship. This was the ship available. And the name of the ship, the idea that its sign was Castor and Pollux, uh, indicates that on the side were the pa- was the painting of these two brothers, these twin brothers, uh, which would we would equate or be familiar with that Gemini constellation. They were the gods of the ship or of shipping, and thus this boat, this ship, was named Castor Pollux. The sign indicated the name of it. Now, they land at Syracuse. Syracuse is a city on the southwest side of the island of Sicily, and it's about 80 miles from Melita or or so, you know, probably a little more, but right around 80 miles to Syracuse. Then in verse 13, it says, from thence we fetched a compass and came to Regium. Now, this fetched a compass. If, you know, when I first read that, I thought, well, that just means they they found a compass to use in order to know the directionality of, of travel. I'm familiar with the use of a compass. Uh, when, I, when I spend time in the woods deer hunting and, and whatnot, I generally always have a compass on me. I was taught that from a, a very young lad. My father Uh, taught me how to use and how to read a compass. But that's not what this means here. The idea of fetching a compass, I believe in the American Standard Version, it's translated took a circuit or went on a circuit. And the idea here is um, they, they didn't take a straight course from Syracuse to Regium. Now, the reason being, there wasn't a favorable wind. Now the word that is translated fetched a compass is one word in the Greek and it actually means to come all around. It means to stroll or to vacillate. Now to vacillate in the term of of speaking or communicating, uh, vacillate means go back and forth like speaking with a double tongue or saying one thing at one time, one thing at another time and, and bouncing back and forth and not being true or sticking to uh, one line of, of communication or one uh, word. We don't want to be people that vacillate. We know what it means, and, and the idea of fetch the compass here, of vacillating uh, from the standpoint of being in the ship, means that the ship is going back and forth. No direct route. Uh, it also means uh, to veer or... It could be translated vagabond or wanderer, and so one who wanders about. So basically what we learn here is that when this ship left Syracuse, it was wandering. It was uh, vacillating. It was going to and fro and, and not taking a direct course to Regium. Well, um... If the wind's not blowing favorably, they needed kind of a south, maybe a southwesterly wind uh, to to go there. It didn't happen. But they finally make it, working with what they had. 
Now, this particular city uh, means, regium means to break off. And if you looked at a map, in fact, I don't know how well you can see this one, but you can see Malta or Miletus or Melita rather here. Here is Syracuse on the island of Sicily and here is Regium. And right in between Sicily and the boot, uh, the toe of the boot of Italy uh, is, is the straits called uh, Messina, the Straits of Messina. And it appears like the island of Sicily just broke off the mainland. And so this city is, is name, so named, and its literal meaning is to break off. And so they come to that little pass, and, and they're, you know, it's on the southern tip of Italy, and it's the southern opening to those streets, uh, to those straits, rather, of Messina that they're going to travel through to go to their next stop. Now, in verse number 13, it goes on to say, after one day, the south wind blew. That is, they were there for one day. The next day, the wind started blowing favorably. They needed that south wind to continue in their northerly direction. And they, the next day, they came to Puti, uh, uh, Puti, uh, uh, <laughs> I'll say it right in just a minute. I practiced this before the video. Putioli. Putioli. And uh, that particular place is the, the harbor of the grain ships for Rome. It was the primary harbor that was used by the city of Rome. Now, from here, there's still a good 130 miles over land to Rome. And they're about 180 miles from those straits of Messina where they left with that south wind. They made it in about 26 hours with a favorable wind. That's about the the, the time of the destination, and they come to Putoli, and uh, Putioli, uh, I should say. And this particular place uh, had brethren there. Notice in verse number 14, where we found brethren and were desired to tarry with them seven days, and so we went toward Rome. There were some brethren uh, that that were found here, fellow Christians, individuals that had obeyed the gospel. I don't know how large the church may have been in that place, but I know that there were some who heard about Paul coming um, and, and met Paul, and so he stays with them for seven days. They asked that they would stay. It says, uh, we found brethren and were desired to tarry. That is, they desired us to tarry with them. And again, this is that favor that Paul had. He was able to stay with them for a little bit of time. Uh, maybe seven days was so that they could be there on the Lord's day to worship with him, much like it happened at Troas in Acts 20 and verse 7. Now, that's just speculation. We can't know that for sure because the scriptures don't say. In Acts 20 and verse 7, it indicated that Paul tarried at Troas and, and his express purpose was to assemble with the brethren on the Lord's day. Opportunity to preach and encourage the church to partake of the Lord's supper with them. Maybe that was the same here. We're not told that for certain. So all we can do is, is offer that as a possibility, but leave it right there as a possibility because uh, we don't really know why uh, they stayed for that entire seven days. But the centurion was willing to show Paul this favor to allow him to spend this time with the brethren. And then at the end of verse 14, so we went toward Rome. And from thence, when the brethren heard of us, they came to meet us as far as Appy Forum. Uh, the word forum there means marketplace. So the marketplace or the market of Appy. And then the three taverns was another little town on the way. Again, let me refer to the map here and show you. Here is, is Rome way up here. There's three taverns. There is Appy Forum right there. They are down here at Pitoli and uh, right here. And then Appy Forum, three taverns, and Rome. And, and so uh, what we learn is that brethren at Rome heard about Paul. They didn't wait for him to get all the way to Rome. They traveled down to these other places to meet him. In fact, uh, Appy Forum, or the market of Appy, was about 43 miles south of Rome, and Three Taverns was about 
33 miles south of Rome. And on foot, you're looking at least a day's travel, maybe a little bit more. But they travel down there to meet Paul and, and travel with him or escort him on to, to Rome. And I want you to notice here that uh, these brethren encourage Paul. Now, it's possible that Aquila and Priscilla could have been a part of this group. We read in Romans chapter 16 that there was a congregation of the Lord's people that met in their home. So they were a part of a group of Christians in the city of Rome. And it seems like there are two groups that come. One goes to Apiform, the other goes to three taverns, and, and they meet Paul along the way. It's possible that Aquila and Priscilla or some of the others mentioned in Acts chapter 16 as being in Rome uh, came and were a part of this entourage that met Paul. But what we know here, what is said, is that at the end of verse 15, whom when Paul saw, he thanked God and took courage. I want to take note of for just a minute as we bring this second part of Acts 28 to a close. We did some exposition. There were some things we needed to explain there, places and and other names and, and ideas that need to be understood. But I think this is a great lesson to take away from this. I want you to note the benefit of brethren here, of being with brethren. For two years, Paul had been imprisoned. It's been over two years since he has been able openly to meet with brethren. He's had opportunity to be refreshed by the brethren, He's had opportunity to be encouraged by brethren. And every time we see those small moments, Paul is able to gain courage. And, and I want us to take note of the benefit of being with brethren that's pointed out here. Paul was encouraged. And by encouraged, think about the main part of that word encourage, the idea that he took courage from them. Paul is headed to Rome as a prisoner. He is about to be able to stand before Caesar and preach the gospel to give his appeal unto Caesar. Now, it's going to be two years or more before Paul is able to do that, but that's where he's headed. That's what he is anticipating in Rome. And at this point, when these brethren come to meet Paul, his courage is increased. Because he was able to be with the brethren, he was able to be courageous. One of the reasons I invite you to our in-person Wednesday Bible study on Wednesday night, a lot of people call Wednesday hump day. It's in the middle of the week. You've dealt with part of the week already outside of the purview of the church. You've worked in the secular world. You've been around uh, people of secular uh, nature, those who are set on on things of this temporal world. And by the time you get to Wednesday, the influence and, and so forth can be load-bearing. And you have an opportunity on Wednesday evening to come together with brethren and pray together, to praise God together, to, to study His Word, His communication to us together. What a shot in the arm that is. That Wednesday night Bible study, that Wednesday prayer meeting is able to encourage us to continue on and help us through the rest of the week. The Sunday time in which we are able to come together and worship God and be with brethren, and perhaps other times where we're able to assemble with brethren, such as gospel meetings or other occasions where we can have our strength renewed, where we can have our courage built. It is good. I want you to think about of course, in the Old Testament, you have Aaron and Hur. Great examples. <clears throat> Remember when Israel was, was in battle, Joshua is leading the way. And as long as Moses has his arms extended with the rod of God in his hand, Israel was winning. But if you've ever held your arms outright for any length of time, you understand that they can grow weary. And especially if something is within your hands. So Moses' arms begin to get weary and they begin to droop, they begin to fall, and Joshua's army and leading the army begins to falter. And so Aaron and Hur, they will support, they will, 
they will hold up the arms of Moses. What a benefit. That's what these brethren were doing for Paul. I want you to remember the, the admonitions of the New Testament toward brethren and the coming together and being in one another's company. I want you to think about 1 Peter chapter 3. In 1 Peter chapter 3, there is the uh, words of, of the Apostle Peter, First uh, Peter 3 and verse number 8, when he says, Finally, be all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous. In talking about their relationship one with another, he tells them to have compassion one for another, to have brotherly love between them. Uh, the idea of being courteous or gentle one toward another. We have this obligation, and, and when that is carried out, it is good for brethren to be together. There is mutual support that comes from that. First Peter chapter 4 and verse 9 says, Use hospitality one to another without grudging. Demonstrate hospitality to each other. Make time for your brethren. You need them, and they need you. And we learn from Paul here the great need for those brethren. Romans chapter 12. And keep in mind, Paul is headed to Rome, and he writes to the Roman brethren. And, and no doubt, you know, that, of course, the book of Romans was written a couple of years, maybe three years, before Paul was able to arrive there. So the church in Rome had received this epistle as Paul is returning to Jerusalem uh, from his third missionary journey. We talked about that back in Acts chapter 20 and 21. Paul writes that letter uh, with anticipation of getting to Rome. He's not knowing at that point what would befall him in Jerusalem, but it, it curtailed his, his effort. It stopped him from being able to get to Rome as quickly as possible. But yet, three years before, Paul had written to these brethren, in Romans chapter 12 and verse 8, when he said, Or he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity, he that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness, let love be without dissimulation or hypocrisy, let it be true, let it be genuine, abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good, be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another, the idea of preferring one another is the idea that you are going to put the needs of your brother ahead of your own. You're going to be concerned about their needs, their desires, and what is for their good and their benefit. And then he says, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, distributing to the necessity of the saints, given to hospitality, Bless them that persecute you. Bless and curse not. Rejoice with them that rejoice. Weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits and recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Paul gives some instructions, practical application instructions to the church at Rome. And now, three years later, that instruction that he gave to Rome concerning their relationship one with another is benefiting this apostle because they come preferring him. They come with, with brotherly love. They come concerned about his well-being and happy and elated to see him. And it benefits the apostle Paul. And, and in benefiting the Apostle Paul, he is encouraged about, about the potential of Rome and in the, the preaching and the, the proclamation of the gospel because of what he is seeing in these brethren. So notice the benefit of being with brethren here and the encouragement that Paul got from it and how he was ready and more willing to go to Rome at this point than even he was before. And think about what he had said three years prior in Romans chapter 1, uh, verse, uh, verse number 11. He says, For I long to see you, that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end that ye may be established. 
Um, in verse 13, he says, I have purpose to come unto you, but was let hitherto, or I was hindered to this point, that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. And then he says in verse 15, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. And this reception from these brethren in Rome is something that helps Paul to be bold, to be courageous, and to be what he desired to be for the church at Rome, even though he was incarcerated. And we'll find out that for the space of at least two years, because the book of Acts closes at that point, that for two years, Paul was going to be preaching to whoever would come. He was under house arrest, so he couldn't necessarily go to them, but he could preach to whoever would come to him, anyone that he was able to come in contact with. So Paul finally gets to Rome. Now, and uh, we see that benefit of, of being with brethren. And I think the application that we really need to focus on there is how much interest we should have in our brethren and, and how great our efforts should be to be with our brethren. When the brethren assemble, when the brethren come together for our regular worship, for our regular Bible study, for our gospel meetings, for other gatherings where we may come together, we need to make a great effort because it may just be on that one occasion that our presence was the reason some other brother or sister in Christ was able to, to gender the courage to remain faithful unto the Lord in times of great distress. You never know what your brethren are going through, what they're facing uh, that, that they haven't informed you about or that you were unaware of but that your presence might be that which strengthens them, which benefits them, which encourages them to faithfulness and courage to, to carry on the work of the kingdom. That was the case with the Apostle Paul. Now, with verse 17, we begin the final part of Acts 28. Three parts. The miracles at Miletus, the final, uh, finally realizing Rome in verse 11 through 16, and now the two years in Rome under house arrest, verse 17 through 31. And Paul is going to begin his effort here as he did everywhere else he ever preached. He's going to go to the Jews first. Now, again, he can't go to them, but he can call those Jewish leaders unto him. So as he begins the effort, verse number 17 says, it came to pass that after three days, Paul called the chief Jews together and when they were come together, he said unto them, Men and brethren, though I have committed nothing against the people or customs of our fathers, yet was I delivered prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans, who, when they had examined me, would have let me go, because there was no cause of death in me. But when the Jews spake against it, I was constrained to appeal unto Caesar, not that I had aught to accuse my nation of, for this cause, therefore, I have called for you, to see you and to speak with you because that for the hope of Israel I am bound with this chain. So these first uh, words, this, this first occasion of being able to meet with the Jews in Jerusalem, Paul is trying to uh, set the, the communication. He's trying to set the record straight. Paul doesn't know if word has reached Rome already about his situation and his circumstance. So if it is, he wants to correct it. If it hasn't, they're going to know uh, from his lips what the situation is. And it would appear that there may have been speculation that Paul had those going before saying he had something against the, the Jewish nation, something against Israel. And because he, a, he, a Jew, a Pharisee of the Pharisees, knowing Paul's pedigree, because he had appealed to Caesar, it could have been perceived by those Jews in that realm that he was coming with some accusation against the people of the homeland, the Israelite nation. And Paul wants to be clear, I have no ought against them. I'm not bringing an accusation. The reason that I've had to appeal to Caesar is because when initially Rome found no, no guilt, no cause of death in me, the, uh, 
They would have set me free, but the Jews didn't want me to be set free. And so I had to appeal to Caesar. And it wasn't because I had ought against my brethren. I'm not here to bring charge or accusation against them. Uh, I, I'm here because I had no other recourse. So Paul sets that. Now, the Jews uh, say, verse 21 and, and 22, uh, we haven't heard anything about this. No news has reached us concerning you. We've received no previous explanation of the circumstances of your arrival here. We don't know anything that's gone on in Jerusalem. We know nothing of what happened and, and of your appeal to Caesar and how you arrived here. Uh, but we do hear about this sect that is everywhere spoken against. And I think we talked about the word that is translated sect comes from a Greek word that literally means heresy. And when that term is used of the Christians, it was typically used in that very sense, that the Jews were accusing the Christians of being a, a fanatical uh, wing of the Jewish religion, uh, a perverted uh, or off-base uh, group that was misinterpreting the law and following uh, a man of, of Nazareth by the name of Jesus. It was a derogatory term when it was applied to them. Now, when you look at the uh, other uses of it, it just means division of the Jews. When it was talking about the Pharisees or the Sadducees or the Essenes or even the Herodians, it was talking about various groups that had various um, uh, beliefs or various types of of uh, unique qualities to their uh, structured belief regarding the nation, regarding the religion, or whatever it might be. But when it came to the Jews referring to the Christians as a sect or a, a group that followed Jesus, it was used in a derogatory way, as is indicated by the fact that everywhere it's spoken against. Wherever you go, you hear about this group of people and the talk is negative. So, Paul, we would like to hear what you have to say about this. What is it that you would, would say? Now, backing up again to, to Paul's words to them that may have brought about the understanding of this sect everywhere spoken against, Paul had said in verse number 20, For this cause, therefore, I have called you to see you and to speak to you, because that for the hope of Israel I am bound with this chain. He didn't say there it was for what Israel was hoping that he was bound. What Israel hoped was quite different from the actual hope of Israel. Israel had hoped for an earthly resurgence. They had hoped for an earthly king. They had desired to have one after the pattern of David, who would lead them back to world prominence. That's what they hoped for. But that's not what they should have anticipated. Paul says, I am imprisoned, I am incarcerated, I have appealed to Caesar because of these conditions, and it boils down to the fact that for the hope of Israel, for the Messiah's sake, for Christ's sake, I am enchained or I am in bondage. And, and ultimately, the hope of Israel, the only hope Israel had, for that matter, the only hope that any of us have, is in Jesus. And for the sake of Jesus, Paul was, was in prison. And so they want to hear about this sect, indicating, too, that there is a sharp line that is being drawn or has been drawn between the Jew and the Christian. So um, Paul says, uh, well, let's think about what Paul knows, what, what he sets up here. Um, verse 23, they did appoint a day. And there came many to him into his lodging, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets from morning till evening. Paul spent a whole day 
from morning to evening, you're looking at a 12-hour period. Morning begins at 6 a.m. on the Jewish uh, time. It ended at the evening time of 6 p.m. So from 6 to 6, or roughly in that span of 12 hours, Paul spends the day talking with them, expounding to them, seeking to persuade them, setting up the arguments from Scripture. Now here's what Paul knew. The history and the prophecy of Israel, the Old Testament, all of that history and what all of the prophets were talking about was Christianity. The Messiah coming, the Christ, the anointed one entering into the world, and establishing his kingdom, which he did. We know from Colossians chapter 3, one of the epistles that Paul wrote while he was a prisoner in Rome in this two-year period, that the Colossian brethren had been translated into the kingdom of God's dear son. So Paul believed that the kingdom had been established. When he wrote that book, while Paul is sitting under house arrest in Rome at the end of the book of Acts, he believed that the kingdom had already been established. That's why he preached and testified the kingdom of God. And what he's doing, or what he is, what Luke sums up here, is that Paul is going to the Old Testament. He's taking the historical record, he's taking the words of the prophets, and he is indicating to these Jews what has happened with Jesus, with the Christ, his death, his burial, his resurrection, the sounding forth by his apostles of the declarations of the kingdom, the establishment of that church, that kingdom. That's exactly what the prophets had been foretelling. So Paul understood that the history and the prophecy of the Old Testament was leading to uh, something, and it was leading to Christianity. That's his point. That's what Paul understood about it. That's what you and I should understand about it. I know that there are still some today who think that somehow the church was a secondary plan. It was a plan B. It wasn't really what was supposed to happen, and and the rejection of the Jews was unanticipated, so so Jesus sets up a, a church until such a time he can come again and set up his kingdom. But Paul says that the history and the prophecy is focused on the fact that Jesus would establish his kingdom. And as far as Paul is concerned, that happened. And the product is Christianity. The product is the church. The product is the kingdom that is not of this world into which we have been translated when we have obeyed the gospel. And so Paul presents that, demonstrating from the Old Testament the proof. Paul is setting up argumentation here. He is laying out the arguments. He is showing it, laying it out there. And it's interesting that, that we would look at it that way, because notice in verse number 24, it says, Some believe the things which were spoken. And the word belief here is not the, the normal word, pistuo or, or pistis, the idea of faith. The word that is translated belief in this passage is not the one most commonly used. And this word means, um, while the results would be the same as the, the other word that's normally used, this is a process of crisis of being convinced or persuaded. What we're saying here is that, that Paul was teaching and these Jews began to be persuaded. They were hearing the arguments that Paul was laying out and they were, they were reasonable enough to think about them, to weigh them, to look at the evidence and make a determination or reach a conclusion based on the evidence. Now, there are going to be those that believe not, those who are going to continue to disbelieve, and it doesn't matter what evidence is presented to them. We run into this kind of thing every day uh, from people in, in all different kinds of, of discussion, whether it's religious, whether it's political, no matter what it is, we've got to be a people that are able to lay out the arguments. 
I was speaking with a, a man this past Sunday after the morning worship service. And uh, of course, the sermon, if you had listened to it in the live stream or one of the archives, was dealing with the music that is to be used in worship and the argument as to why vocal music uh, of an a cappella nature with the words that are psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs is authorized, but instrumental music is not. And in laying out that argumentation, I went to the scriptures, showed from the scriptures what was presented, what the Bible says about music in worship. And, and there's several passages that use the term sing in connection with understanding, that is the words that, that are being said, and speaking to ourselves, communicating to each other with these songs that praise God, that thank God, that make requests of God, that, that spur us to spiritual activity. But what you don't find in the scripture is the passage of direct commandment to use an instrument of music, a mechanical instrument, uh, you don't find a passage that shows example of the first century church using mechanical instruments of music, and you don't have an implied statement. You, you don't have any implication from Scripture that the first century church was authorized to use instrumental music, and thus we shouldn't either, because the Bible says nothing of it. We are to reject it. The, the silence of Scripture is a means by which God negates the activity or condemns the activity. And so we were discussing that after the worship assembly, and I, I made the point that we need to get back in this nation with our educational system to a point where we do teach debate, we do teach logic, we do help our, our students to understand how to lay out arguments, how to, to ponder arguments, how to consider arguments, not in the sense of, of knock down, drag out fights, verbal fights, but the idea that we present argumentation. We use logic to present an argument, a true argument, a valid argument, from which then a conclusion, a right conclusion can be reached. And, and we're, we're losing that ability. What's happening here in, in Paul's discussion with the Jews is he's making the argument. He's laying out the evi evidence. He, he's got his premises, his major and minor premise that leads to this conclusion. And there are those who are hearing it, they're weighing it, and they're saying, yes, that makes sense. They are being persuaded. Now, with that persuasion... There is going to be that trust in God that results. The normal word uh, for belief or faith in Scripture, that idea of pistuo or pistis, that they had faith in God. They took God at his word. They believed God so as to respond with certain action. Well, here they are in that process leading to that point because of the arguments Paul has laid out. And, and you and I need to study to show ourselves approved unto God, handling the right word of truth according to 1 Timothy chapter 2, or 2 Timothy 2.15. But we also have to be ready to give an answer of the hope that is in us with meekness and fear, 1 Peter 3.15. We need to be able to lay out the arguments as to why what we do is right, why what we believe is right, why this is the truth. And that's what Paul was doing. And, and that led some to really get the wheels of the mind turning and giving it consideration, saw it to be rational, saw it to be reasonable, saw it to be right, and were in the process of being persuaded as that 12-hour discussion went on. Now, ultimately, you have mixed results because there will be those who will continue uh, to be persuaded. There will be those who continue in disbelief, and they won't be able to come to an agreement. And thus, in verse number 25, they're just going to depart. After Paul had spoken one word, Paul says one more thing. And it's a quotation of Isaiah 6, 9 and, and uh, 10. And he says, Hearing ye shall hear and shall not understand, seeing ye shall see and not perceive. 
Well, why is it that they would hear but not understand? The things would be said to them. That's what Paul had been doing, but they wouldn't understand. They wouldn't come to a conviction about what Paul said. They would see it. Paul had so laid it out to where it was visible, it could be seen, but they were blind and couldn't see it, couldn't perceive it. Well, why? Because the heart was wax gross and their ears were dull of hearing. Their eyes they had closed, lest they should see with their lips hear with their ears, understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. Paul says the heart is wax gross. The word gross means fattened. And the idea of fat was a way of, of analogy or presenting an analogy of insensitive. Fat is the least sensitive part of the body. No feeling within the fat. No, no nerves uh, come to an end within the fat portion of the flesh. So there's no feeling there. And so their heart, their mind waxing fat is the idea that it was, it was not able to feel. It was not able to, to be touched by those things because they'd close their eyes. They didn't want to hear. They didn't want to see. And so there would be no conversion. Without that willingness to see, without that willingness to understand, without that willingness to properly perceive, there would be no turning of the heart. There would be no conversion, no belief and obedience to that which was being taught. And because of that, Paul says, since you're of this condition, we're turning to the Gentiles. Now, that passage of Scripture is actually quoted four other times in the New Testament. Matthew chapter 13 Mark chapter 4, and Luke chapter 8. Now, those three occasions are all in the same setting regarding why Jesus spoke in parables. And, and with that, he tells them, for you, his apostles, his disciples, it is to understand because you're going to perceive, you're going to look into, you're going to weigh these things out and comprehend. But for the others, they won't. They're going to remain blind. They're going to be satisfied with their blindness and these things will not affect them, will not turn their heart. And then it was used in John chapter 12 and verse number 40 as well. But always a reference to those of Israel. But that doesn't mean it's a condition that only Israel could be guilty of. You and I could be just as guilty today if we're unwilling to ponder, consider, and weigh the evidence of Scripture for what is right and what is wrong, what we ought to believe, and what we ought to obey, what we ought to be doing. We don't want to be blind. But I want you to notice that Paul was not discouraged by the disbelief of, of some. Because with these were, or when he had said these words, the Jews departed and had great reasoning among themselves. But Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house and received all that came in unto him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which would concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. Paul was untethered in his opportunities to preach to anyone that would come unto him. Paul was, he was undisturbed by the disbelief of some. He continued on in his preaching and teaching. He didn't allow a a portion of those that, that heard him and closed up their eyes to it to keep him from teaching. He didn't just sit down and stop because someone didn't believe. He found someone who would. He continued teaching until he did find those that would obey. So he spent the next two years working feverishly for the kingdom. In that two-year period, he writes the book of Ephesians, the book of Philippians, the book of Colossians, and even the book of Philemon, quite possibly 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and maybe Titus. Now, it would seem that there's a duration of time he is released from this prison, able to do some other things, and then is re-imprisoned and dies in 68 AD, at which point he would have written at least 2 Timothy, Others are persuaded that he never was actually released here, but spent the rest of his time as a prisoner in Rome until finally he was put to death by Nero. Either way, he didn't, he didn't pine away 
in his condition. He made the most of what his condition was. And I think that's a great lesson for us. We cannot always control the circumstances that we find ourselves in. We can't always control the health circumstances. We can't always control the economic circumstances. We can't always control the social circumstances, but we can control how we respond to all of those circumstances. And Paul never quit. Paul continued to be strong. Yes, he was a prisoner. Yes, there were those that didn't believe. Yes, there were those that that referred to him as the ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes who diminished him in their own eyes. But that didn't keep Paul from working for the Lord and nor should our circumstances keep us from working for the Lord either. Whatever they may be, find opportunity in those circumstances to advance the kingdom of God. That's what Paul did. And when you look at the book of Philippians, you'll find out that Paul was very uh, powerful in his work. In Philippians chapter 1, Paul in, in verse uh, number uh, 12, um, he says, I would ye should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather under the furtherance of the gospel. Paul said, what's happened to me? Remember, he's writing this during this two-year house, two house arrest in Rome. He says, what's happened to me has actually benefited the gospel. The gospel is able to go places that it hadn't otherwise gone. Well, when you get over here, not only because of him in, in his preaching, but the courage it gave to others to preach the gospel too. But in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 22, he says, All the saints salute you chiefly, they that are of Caesar's household. Paul had influence inside Nero's own house. And there were those inside Nero's house that were converted to the gospel, that saluted the brethren at Philippi, brethren who supported Paul, perhaps helped him have that own hired house, that place that he was able to rent and support himself as far as, as uh, uh providing for those bills, for that rent, uh, his own expenses. Maybe, you know, he, he refers to the Philippian brethren as being the congregation that supported him, the congregation that helped him. Well, there they did in that case too. So Paul made the most of his circumstances and brethren, you and I should too. Let us be the kind of brethren that support each other. Be the kind of brethren who, when we are in fellowship and association, in company one of another, we are benefited because of that companionship and that company. And then, no matter the circumstances, let us keep on working in the kingdom. Well, that's the book of Acts. Great work. The kingdom has gone from, from Jerusalem all the way to Rome. And we have seen in the 30-year history that is covered in the book of Acts, we have seen it go from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria and even to the uttermost part of the earth. The kingdom advanced. Now, there were those who tried to stop it, but it just kept right on going. Don't you be a reason that it falters in your community. Be like Paul. Make use of your circumstances and your conditions in opportunities to advance the kingdom.